Yersinia pestis. So what is Yersinia pestis? Basically, it's a gram-negative coctobacillus that does not produce spores. So meaning gram-negative that it has a thin peptidoglycan layer surrounded by a cell membrane on both sides. This bacteria additionally is non-modal, so it does not move within the media. And lastly, the bacteria is a mesophile, so it prefers temperatures around 28 degrees Celsius. It is also able to survive in phagocytic and proliferate cells, so in case it is hosted inside the body, it is not able to get digested by the system of the human or animal. So reservoirs of infections, it is a zoonotic bacteria, meaning a disease which can be passed between animals and humans. Humans can also get infected by skinning infected animals, getting scratched by an infected animal, or getting bitten by an infected animal. Specifically, rat fleas have this, but there are over 30, 30 different species in which the bacteria can use as a vector. Usually, rodents have these fleas, squirrels, and prairie dogs as well. Some modes of transmission are through flea bites, contact with contaminated tissue or fluid, and infectious droplets. So the most common type is through direct infection caused by flea bites and contact with host animals. So the bubonic plague and the systemic plague are caused by this. So if a flea were to bite a human, they would get this disease. If a human were to get in contact with some sort of tissue that had this disease or fluid, they would get this disease as well. So like I mentioned before, if somebody were to skin an animal and the animal had this disease, the human would get it. And the pneumonic plague is one from indirect contact from droplets via an infected individual. So if somebody were to sneeze and they had this disease, they would get it. So cover your mouth when you sneeze. It'll make it best for everybody. Now some portals of entry. It's basically how does it get through our body? So two ways is through the blood or air droplets. Now after entering the body, it enters the lymph system through leaky capillaries. And this is for the bubonic plague. Once it is in our body, they're able to take hold in the body and cause the infection. So inside our bodies, it gets through the lymph system and it gets to our lymphs, lymph nodes inside our groin area or armpit area, causing them to swell up. and causing these lymph nodes to become ca causing these lymph nodes to become infected because it circulates through the lymph system and causing the lymph nodes to become swollen causing them to be called buboes this bacterium is able to take hold in our body for many reasons one of them being its many virulence factors. An important one is the fact that it lacks an impact on its vector, meaning that those that carry it, such as fleas, prairie dogs, and squirrels, do not get infected by the bacteria and do not get sick and die. This gives them the ability to transport or be transported to other organisms to infect, to grow, and spread. Additionally, as said before, it is unable to be digested by phagocytic cells within bodies. This is because it produces an endotoxin that prevents it against lysis. Lysis meaning the digestion of a cell. Additionally, the bacteria has an abundance of plasmids, 
not just ordinary plasmids. Two of the three plasmids that are very common within Yersinia pestis give it the ability to reproduce and cause infection quickly and effectively. Lastly, an important virulence factor is its ability to steal iron from other cells and organisms. Iron is very important as a building block within cells and it is also important for metabolic processes. This disease has many signs and symptoms, but it also takes form of many diseases. There are specifically three types of diseases that this organism causes. The most commonly known is the bubonic plague. Next is a septic, septicemic plague. And lastly, pneumonic plague. All three of these have very similar symptoms, including fever, chills, and headaches. The bubonic plague specifically causes the person to feel extremely weak and have swollen lymph nodes, specifically in the groin and armpit area. Septemic plague has slightly different signs and symptoms, including sharp abdominal pain, shock from the infection, internal bleeding, and the blackening of extremities. This is where it gets the common phrase, the black plague, because of the color change within the cells. Lastly, there is pneumonic plague. With similar symptoms to the other two, differing with having pneumonia, shortness of breath, disgusting mucus filled with blood, and can be watering and severe chest pains. All of these have very similar symptoms to other common diseases, making them hard to distinguish at first. And it isn't until the bacteria is in large enough numbers that it is able to be properly identified separately from the other ones. If we look at the percentage of the disease that are caused, we can see that the bubonic plague causes on average 13.5% of the mortalities of the disease in the time it is in the United States. A uh, septemic plague has a mortality of 22% and pneumonic plague with 57%. All of these are just specifically within the cases that are in the United States. It is important to realize that this disease is native to every continent except for Australia. Additionally, it is still a problem in many other countries, specifically Madagascar and Africa. So the bubonic plague, it has very common symptoms such as feeling feverish, chilly, having a headache. But some things that are separate are the fact that it causes swollen, tender lymphs that become buboes, which are filled with the infection. It is important to know that this is not spread from person to person, and only a small percent develop the secondary form of this disease, pneumonic plague. The bacteria enters the bloodstream and through leaky capillaries gets into the lymph nodes. With its ability to produce the endotoxins, it survives against the phytocytic cells. It causes the lymph nodes, specifically groin, groin and armpit areas, to enlarge. The fever and swelling develop rapidly, and the incubation period is short, being only 2 to 10 days. And after 24 hours of feeling the fevers, chills, and weakness, one or more of the lymphs will become swollen. If untreated, it can turn into many of the other forms of the plague, and it will eventually cause death. If untreated, the mortality rate of this disease is 100%, but with proper treatment and care, it has gone down to 13.5%. 
Sepatemic plague is also not tr transmitted person to person. A small percentage of people also get pneumonic plague from having this. It has similar symptoms to the bubonic plague, including fever, chills, but more distinctively, it causes nausea and abdominal pain and induces vomiting. Additionally, it causes the cells in our extremities, specifically our toes, hands, nose, ears, the smaller things, to turn black and die, specifically called necrosis. It also causes our blood to coagulate, causing clots, clots <laughs> and causing problems within the body. Even with treatment, the mortality rate of this one is quite high, at 22%. Additionally, if surviving, most people will have loss of extremities due to the blackening of extremities where the cells completely die off. Lastly, with pneumonic plague, which accounts for 12% of U.S. cases in the past 50 years, has the highest mortality rate at 57%, even with treatment. It also has the shortest incubation period of only two to four days. Similarly to the other ones, it has a fever, chills, and just overall discomfort. But difference is that it causes pneumonia trouble breathing, horrible coughs, bloody vomit, bloody mucus. The major difference is the fact that it is the only one that is transmitted person to person through air droplets. Basically, when a person coughs or sneezes when they have this disease, it gets into the air around them and they can infect many people in a short period of time. This is why this one is the most deadly, but it is also typically in accompanying to the other forms of the plague. So now we get to look at the epidemiology, specifically three pandemics that occurred that most people have heard about. The first one being in 541-542 AD. It started in Egypt and spread through Europe. It killed approximately 60% of the population, having over 10,000 deaths per day. This one, there are not a lot. There isn't a lot to be known or said about it because history, written history back then, wasn't at its strongest. Another plague that happened, called the Modern Plague, in 1855, started in China and spread through the world, killing approximately 12 million people. And in 1900, it gave birth to the first case in the United States specifically in San Francisco, California. The one that almost everyone knows about is the Black Death, occurring in Europe for approximately 100 years from 1346 to 1446. It killed approximately one-third of the European population. The reason it got its name is because it ha of its characteristics, abilities, to cause people's extremities to turn black or blue from hemorrhages. It caused a drastic change in art, history, and politics. All three of these had great impact on people because so many people died, especially because there weren't modern treatments and identification of the disease was difficult. A lot of the deaths had no timeline because there were no resources or ability to track how many people died. The 2016 Madagascar outbreak, which occurred in Bafotaka, it was in one of the poorest, most remote and dangerously place, dangerous place in Madagascar. Dr. Arthur R. stated that plague is a disease of poverty because it's, it thrives in places with poor sanitary conditions and health services. A citizen in Madagascar saw the incident and reported it to the officials of the country, who then reported it to the World Health Organization. And even though they received help from 
the WHO. It wasn't easy because the aides were receiving threats from the other citizens in Madagascar. Investigators suspect that another cause for the outbreak was a sudden change in the environment, which it had not experienced for a long time. Another cause was deforestation. In order to control the outbreak, treatments and pest control were put into action. Okay, Yersinia's pestis was used as a biological weapon. Okay, everyone knows that anthrax was used, like it's the most commonly known one. But Yersinia pestis has a long history of bioterrorism. It has been one of the most dangerously used biological weapon. It spreads rapidly and widely and is very contagious and inf infectious as well as it has a high rate of mortality, as portrayed in the past. This bacteria is still considered as one of the top most deadly biological weapons today, especially since it can be used in many different forms, such as from its purest form, to aerosol products, to even solids, liquids, it can be turned into a massive weapon. Most of the concerns with this being used as a weapon is that it has a low infectious dose. It can be spread from human to human contact or from animal to human contact. And it's, of course, airborne. And it spreads, it spreads very, very quickly. OK, for the diagnosis and treatment and also prevention. Prevention isn't really easy as it's often misdiagnosed in the first, like the early stages. But if it is treated after diagnosis, the antibiotics used are either very scarce or they are not FDA approved or they have a limited clinical experience. Streptomycin is the most commonly used one, but it is, it's the, like the most scarce product. And then there is the level flow, level flow sinin, that it is commonly found, but it is only tested on animals and hasn't had enough clinical experience. Not so fun facts. The plague is still going around and the cases are increasing, of course, because the worldwide population is also increasing. And the treatment options have not really improved. And also, and it, it is very easy to be dis misdiagnosed, even with the modern technology and medicine available today. Okay, so for the case study, we have this scenario right here. 2016 Seattle, Washington sheep farm outbreak. After visiting the farm, 96 people were diagnosed with pneumonia and 57 were readmitted within a week of diagnosis with more severe respiratory problems. After re-evaluation, Yersinia pestis was discovered to be the causing agent. This outbreak led to an investigation by the CDC which found out that all of the patients have recently visited a sheep farm and all came into contact with the owner's dog. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that the dog was infested with carrier fleas. Question, why was it so difficult to identify the causing agent of 